Previously on Manzikert, Manuel and his army managed to storm Ragusa in the middle of the night. Zachary and Alphacos, assisted by Wilfred and a few other veteran Varangians, escaped the city by the skin of their teeth. They decided to travel to Rome, where Eleftherios had just captured the city from Carolos, declaring the city to be under the rule of Alphacos. The only problem, they had hundreds of miles of ground to cover before reaching Rome. Wilfred worried they would be targeted. Zachary had an idea on how to disguise themselves. They dressed up as Jewish pilgrims once again, claiming to be going to see a famous rabbi in Rome. At first, the disguises seemed to work, as they were able to reach northern Italy in a few nights without being disturbed. One night, they decided to rest in the town of Trento. The townspeople were suspicious of the group, and immediately acted hostile towards them. Wilfred got into a shouting match with another man outside the local inn just before dusk. Zachary managed to convince him to calm down, and the group went to bed. That morning, the group awoke to a mob of locals outside the inn. Apparently, a boy had just gone missing, and they accused the Jewish pilgrims of kidnapping him for a blood sacrifice. It was a blood libel. A fierce argument arose as Zachary tried to explain that they were just on their way to Rome. An angry peasant then stabbed Zachary in the throat, killing him in a matter of seconds. Alphacos screamed as he saw Zachary bleed to death, crying over his dead body. The rest of the mob then drew their pitchforks. Wilfred and the Varangians sprung into action, picking up Alphacos and fighting their way out of the town. They managed to reach Rome a few weeks later. Meanwhile, in Constantinople, King Stephen made a decision to take two-thirds of his army and return to Hungary to fight Manuel. 10,000 of his soldiers, together with the Aegean fleet and the 6,000 men under the command of Leo, would continue the siege. He believed this was just barely enough to do the job. Inside the city, factional infighting continued to rage. Valentino said one of his spies spread rumors among the Zerlocates that the Paulicians were hoarding food. This led to a gang of Zerlocates storming and burning the Paulician church. In response, the Malacates offered to start patrolling Paulician neighborhoods. Valentinos was happy to see the street warfare across the city. He knew that the only reason his people didn't turn on him was because they were too busy killing each other. However, he soon overplayed his hand. Valentinos felt Christos was getting too comfortable criticizing the government, so he sent a few of his men to shake down Christos and get him to tone down his remarks. But Christos had several bodyguards with him, and a brawl broke out. In the fighting, one of Valentinos' men accidentally struck Christos with his sword, killing him. The brazen killing of such a popular figure at daylight caused an uproar throughout the city. At his funeral pyre the next day, Christos' sister, a woman named Sophia, spoke to the crowd for his eulogy. She denounced Valentinos. She accused the patriarch of murdering her brother, referring to Valentinos as the devil incarnate. The speech riled the crowd up into a frenzy, and they rampaged through the streets, lynching dozens of Valentinos' allies across the city. Valentinos cracked down. His men rounded up dozens of known Zerlacate leaders across the city, publicly executing them. He tried arresting Sophia as well, but his men could not find her. Valentinos then put out a massive gold bounty for whoever turned her in. Sophia was hiding in Constantinople's university, protected by Melikos and his supporters. The killing of Christos had shocked Melikos to the core. If Valentinos could kill Christos so brazenly, then no one was safe. Melikos and Sophia then agreed to an alliance, swearing an oath to kill the Patriarch. They called their alliance the Zealous Pact. The Malakates, Zerlakates, and other groups who joined the coalition started calling themselves the Zealots. Malakos called for all his supporters to hear him outside the university. At the same time, Sophia called up all the Zerlakates to action. They both gave rousing speeches to their supporters, calling on them to immediately take action and overthrow Valentinos. Before long, the imperial capital descended into complete chaos. Valentinos' soldiers completely lost control of the situation. A mob of zealots then stormed the imperial palace. They threw Valentinos out of the palace's window. The mob then began searching for Emperor Isaacos, but he was nowhere to be found. In the commotion, the entire palace was ransacked. Precious items such as the throne were lost. Sophia and Melikos then entered the palace. They declared themselves to be the new co-regents of Emperor Isaacos, and thus, rulers of the empire. The Zealots' regime now ran Constantinople. However, without Emperor Isaacos, who they claimed to be the regents for, they lacked legitimacy. For now, Melikos and Sophia did not want to choose a new emperor. They wanted Isaacos to remain in power, so that he could be easily controlled. Isaacos had to be found. The Zerlakates and Melakates searched the city, 
while Melikos interrogated a few officials from Valentinos' former government. As it turned out, a few days ago, Valentinos had hired a famous Moroccan pirate named Shamir al-Dani to smuggle Isakos out of the city, through Leo's blockade, and into friendly territory in Greece. To get close to Constantinople, Aldani posed as a merchant ship that was selling goods and supplies to Governor Leo. By doing this, he was able to sneak past the blockade under the cover of night, and take Isakos to safety. But Aldani was not taking Isakos to Greece. He had a wealthier patron than Valentinos. He sailed out of the Aegean and towards Antioch, which the Ghaznavids now occupied, having conquered the entire principality of Antioch. There, he delivered Isakos to Sultan Bahram Shah. The Sultan was growing bolder by the day. He had already begun preparations to invade the Kingdom of Jerusalem. After that, he planned on even invading Egypt. This civil war in the Roman Empire presented him with a new opportunity. He knew conquering the Roman Empire outright was probably impossible, but placing a puppet on the imperial throne, that was doable. He took an Isaacos, raising him as one of his own sons, converting the boy to Islam and giving him a new name, Ishaq bin Ruma. One of Rome's greatest enemies was now born.